the Season Podcast, a show where we deep dive into hospitality and the people that run it. I'm Ram, co-founder of Recipe, joined with Chef Tushar Shud as a host of the product podcast. Hi, I'm Tushar Shud and welcome to the podcast. The guest that we have today is someone that I feel has been one of the most influential people in changing the F&B landscape in Bangalore. Uh, she's the co-founder, owner of the Courtyard community and this beautiful space where we get to shoot today. Hi Akila, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. And thank you for the conservatory or the thank you for the be- beautiful space to shoot. Uh, before we deep dive into Courtyard and, and how this began, uh, we just wanted to know a little background about A, your architecture site and also the life before this. We, yeah. uh, while doing the research, we got to know that you lived in US before coming back. So just a little bit of information yeah. on that. So um, to just start off, I, you know, I think my intro has to start with I'm a complete Bangalore girl through and through, right? And so everything uh, really starts with that for me. Um, went to school here, um, you know, I was in RV college here. I did my architecture there. Then I went to the US to what, um, in 2008 and 2009, I was there. So I was in New York um, for, for, those, for those two years. And I did my master's in urban design and urban design was, um, was the love of my life until it changed for, you know, for this. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed doing that and that just gave me a whole new perspective on what cities should be like and what needs to be happening in them for us to kind of not merely survive but actually live meaningfully, right? So that was really the shot of from where to where, you know, it's been. Um, but yeah, otherwise, um, you know, um, I don't call myself an architect anymore because I don't practice it. But, you know, it's all around me. Yes, um, uh, like, yeah. you, know, you were reading that, you know, from, you're taking inspiration from Lal Mahal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's very really cool, right? So what was your thought process behind it and what actually yeah. inspired you when you came out? So that again goes back to the whole being like a Bangalore person, right? You're always kind of trying to look for context around you. Uh, and when we had this beautiful terrace space that we were not doing anything with, I think the most... Um, uh, you know, the most kind of impactful part about it was this tree that we have outside here, right? It's a it's a hundred year old rain tree. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time in just Lalbagh as a child, you know, growing up and all of that. And we're on the road that just goes right up there. Um, so I don't know, it felt very natural that um, this place which tries to be the community space for, for Bangalore needs to pay owed, you know, in some way. Um, and it just felt right that we should see if Lalba can be, you know, an inspiration for the, you know, space. And then we had conservatory as an idea that just came up. So it all kind of, you know, came together. And I think being an architect and an urban designer helps in kind of Definitely. trying to connect the dots, you know, as it were. So that really helped, I think. Um, yeah. So from just Lalba to the what conservatory was that, you know, journey of architecture for me as well. That's very cool. Yeah. Is there something you saw similar because you're back in New York and spent yeah. two years doing masters there and you come yeah. back here with the hopes of working in BBMP. Really want to understand how did the <laughs> urban planning and this architecture all go along here? Right? Yeah. So when I was in New York, we, you know, as students, you don't have too much money to go to like really fancy places and all that. So you ended up spending a lot of time at the public spaces there, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, and I went to, you know, I went to university that had a very beautiful campus and it was right in the middle of New York. Right. Um, and um, you felt that, you know, you were part of things even though you were not kind of going to like a very expensive restaurant or very expensive theater or whatever it is, everything was happening right there. Um, and that was really the seed of the idea for why don't we have something like that, you know, here. Um, and when I decided to come back, I realized that, you know, you have to kind of work through the agencies, you know, if you want to use the public spaces to do anything. Um, at Columbia University, where I went, they would they would regularly kind of come and talk to students to actually you know hire them yeah. to actually go you know into you know into the department to work. So did you do some sort of stint there, or did they have just an internship because we didn't have much you know time when I was there? Uh, but that was you know it was it was great because you know you had the government agencies going in and scouting the students from like the best universities to join them which is pretty much the opposite of what really happens here right (laughs) so i came back very idealistically thinking i'll I'll also go join the bbmp or at least i'll try to work with them and see what i can do of course very very soon i realized (laughs) that it was a bad idea 
I mean, it's not like there are not smart people there. There are actually very smart people in, you know, in the department, but the priorities are, are not what I thought it, yeah. you know, it would be. Um, so yeah, anyway, quickly that kind of turned into an opportunity that didn't really work. And we had the space, you know, we had this property and um, I gave myself five years to see if this could work. Because at the this end was of back in which year? This was in uh, 2018 is when we opened the courtyard community. But there was a place called Jaga that used to be here earlier, which I think kind of can trace the DNA of the courtyard community back to, you know, 2011 when we had Jaga here. And that was an art tech space, right? Community space for art and tech. And that was very interesting to watch. And a couple of my friends actually just opened the courtyard cafe um, during that time. And I just helped them do up the space. And within one year, you know how everybody has this dream of, I want to open a cafe, right? right yeah. Now, if somebody tells me that I want to give them money, <laughs> I'm like, it's not, it's not that, that easy as you know, it's not that glamorous either yeah. as it sounds, right? It's a lot of work. I think this market wasn't also so saturated. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's just cafes left. Everywhere, yeah. Because I remember when I came in 2017, back then was the, I think the hippie era of courtyard cafe, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was yeah. the outside seating in it. Yeah, right? yeah. But, uh, Coming back to the thought of, you know, being in the public spaces in yeah. New York yeah. and uh, the same not be, it's not like we don't have parks. Yeah. And wh- why do you think it's difficult in India to build like a public community space oh. and uh, for it to function? Also, like what worked for the courtyard community while you were, because you yeah. were one of the first ones to bring different niches and different uh, yeah. parts of the community together. Yeah. You're not serving one particular uh, yeah. base of the society. So, yeah. like, what, like what, what do you think worked? And before that, why do you think that public spaces don't really work in India? Um, yeah, that's a good question because I think in terms of public spaces, uh, there is there is the history of club, you know, of like just public spaces in India is very very different. It's very tied to religion, uh, which which you know part of the what country, state, city you're from, which, you know, caste you belong to, all of that stuff. So it's very, it's very uh, attached to identity. Hmm. Um, And hence it becomes like, you know, our temple, our ground, not yours, you know, kind of thing. And that happens a lot, you know, here. In cities, of course, it's not so much because everybody is kind of worshipping the only God they know here, which is, you know, like, what money, right, Hmm. basically. Um, But... um, we ha- we do have some great parks, you know, you know, in the city. But I think culture programming in the parks is still something that we don't see. A, because they just don't keep the parks open enough, right? It's open only from this time to this time and then you have to go, right? Uh, more than that, I think people are just not asking for it. You have to ask for it, right? You have to go and make a noise and say, listen, this is what I want to do. And this is, what, yeah, this is what we want to do. It's not being asked for. We're just happy that at least we have a park, you know? And that's kind of the, what mentality I think. Um, and from really what I saw around the world was that parks and just public spaces were you being used as that first access point to learn about a lot of things, be it music, theatre, art, food, whatever it was, right? And that I thought was missing here. Definitely. And um, well, when I when I just quickly came to know that I couldn't do it, you know, in you know like any of the parks, so we you know we tried to do it here. Um, and why it kind of worked here is also, I think, in Bangalore, we do have a lot of good cultural and art spaces. Like, you know, you do you know, have the Ranga Shankara, you have Shunya, mm. you have Jagrati Theatre, you have all these places. But a lot of us don't go there because we feel that if you're not part of that community, you don't fit. yeah, or if you're not serious about that art form, maybe I won't understand, maybe I won't enjoy it, maybe I won't get it. And in a way, I think that helped that I was like a jack of all good for nothing sort of not good at most things, but just, but just interested in everything sort of person. Mm-hmm. And I wanted a space like that, that, you know, where you could just, like just temporarily go and see something, try something, like very, uh, it's like a very easy consumption, mm-hmm. you know, of culture, right? I think that was missing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and that's why, you know, we had the idea to kind of start this, which was like a public space, that there was not very serious curation, but more of, easy culture that we can actually bring in and hence we don't kind of call ourselves only a space for theatre or only food or only this, we're just a space for culture Culture. and that can be anything and everything. So, 
Yeah. Why do you think the transition of like getting into food happened, right? Because yeah. what we noticed from Courtyard is still till date, we see a lot of art communities yeah. coming in, we see a lot of theater stuff, we see all type of age groups come, come yeah. into the Courtyard. Yeah. How exactly did it transition to the food space and what tipped it off? Because you know, you're not from a food background, yeah. what exactly clicked that? Um, yeah, actually, we didn't have so much food earlier. Right. We did have a certain amount of, you know, events that did happen around food. Um, but I think COVID really kind of uh, made us think a little more and see what could work because those two years were difficult to understand how a community space would work, right? Because we were the first to shut and pretty much the last to, you know, open. Remember, they had all these rules of, yeah. you know, theatres open last and, you know, all of that. So we were amongst the guys who had to open last. Yeah. Um, so we had to quickly figure out that, you know, when people are really mortally scared of being in, you know, other people's company, a music show, a theatre show was probably the last thing they would actually come for. They were more interested in kind of having intimate gatherings of their own. And food never fails, you know, right. in that sense. Right? Always connects people. Always connects people. That's something they want to consume no matter what, right? Um, and at, I think at that point also was this happy coincidence of a lot of good chefs mm -hmm. uh, just coming out of just professional kitchens, you know, at that point. I think everybody was having this this moment of what am I doing with my life kind of thing, you know, because of COVID. So a lot of them came out of the you know, professional kitchens. We happened to know a few of them. A few of them had worked with us, you know, in the past. So we're like, let's see what happens. And we started doing a few what pop-ups and they kind of grew. Yeah. And there was a great response to it. And we realized that, listen, food is, is the first hook to bring people back to the space, Good. you know, like after COVID. Uh, and that hook is just something that we got, you know, hooked on to, mm, you know, okay. and we were kind of unable to unhook ourselves from it because we were having so much fun with it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So many cool people you were meeting and uh, people really came out for food, man. They really mm -hmm. did, you know, that was like quite, quite surprising. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really that, it was really that moment of the COVID, like post COVID after like just second wave, I think, is when we kind of realized that food is which is going to keep us going for a right. bit. And we thought we'll go back to... Mm -hmm things All as normal time. but that never happened and I'm glad it didn't. Yeah. I mean like even post-COVID people had that sense of revenge spending mentality. Yeah, they yeah. wanted experiences, they were willing to pay, yeah. they just wanted to go out yeah. being confined in a space for too long. Yeah. I think like you guys coming out and like you know building up a community space at that time for food yeah. helped people bond much yeah. better. And then when did you, because kudos to you for actually making a space that yeah. is pro of chefs. And yeah. like, conservatory was one of the first places even during single thread when you were doing Yeah, jobs. yeah. Uh, Caterings, we loved the conservatory because it was set around a professional yeah. chef. Yeah. You could work the way you do yeah. in a commercial kitchen rather than trying to set up stuff. Yeah. So was that a conscious decision by you yeah. or you know all the chefs around? Chef it was actually a very conscious decision because when we did the pop-ups downstairs, I could see they were struggling. You know, like it didn't feel like the right stage. Mm -hmm. They were kind of making do with the best. I mean, they were trying to you know, do their best with what was there. It's like Jugaad. Yeah, mm. and that was bothering me a lot. You know, every time I saw that happening, I'm like, oh God, I wish I could give them like a proper kitchen and all that because that's what we're used to doing with the artists here, right? When exactly. you have a musician or you have somebody else, you're, you're giving them a stage, mm. you know, you're giving them lights and, you know, like just camera mm. and all that. So it, it looks good. You're propping them up. Right. And that I felt we were not doing with the chefs when we were doing it downstairs because it was, it was not the stage for them. And I think by the time we had done a couple of pop-ups, we realized that this is a performance that mm -hmm. everybody wants to watch. You know, they want to be a part of it. Yeah. So when the conservatory idea came about, there was not a doubt in our minds that it had to be a stage for the mm -hmm. chefs. You know, and like the architecture of it had to reflect really what the, you know, intention was. And the intention was to highlight them, was to spotlight them, was to put them on a platform and show, show people the process, right? So, uh, I think that was a very, very conscious uh, thing. And of course, we had friends like Kavan, Karan, who gave a lot of, you know, inputs and really helped with the entire process of it. So, yeah, yeah. it was really conscious. I think that that's also what kick-started the whole, earlier, initially, before the conservatory opened. Yeah. I think it was a lot of home chefs, yeah. home cooks, and people who were trying to get out of the yeah. uh, commercial space were coming in. But I think the moment conservatory opened, I, it became a hotspot for all the best restaurants in the country. Yeah to come and do pop-ups in Bangalore. And I don't think, because we tried looking at other venues, I don't think, at least in central Bangalore or uh, the main city, 
there is a space like the conservatory uh, where you can do you know intense specialized menus yeah. and pull it off properly yeah so yeah. i believe it also gave a platform to feedback and test the products right, right, right. before anyone went to the market you already had the community was interested in food and then then the chef comes and has a pop up and people actually connect with the person chef knows what's working and what's yeah, not working yeah. and that's what best recently we came for the mescalita pop up because we visited mescalita in bombay and we wanted to see how the experience is different yeah. in bangalore right and then the way the chef explained it and assembled yeah. it here this is a whole cool experience yeah. for us it's absolutely um, you know like i said it is a show Definitely. you're not just coming for a meal you know you're actually coming for a show and um, i think chefs are becoming like superstars you know on instagram they're all Definitely. like influencers and uh, more than that i mean it just shows you that there's a lot of sway that food has you know people kind of take it very seriously um and they are the they are the stars you know at the moment because anybody with that kind of creative skill and that can really kind of like just put off a show um it's very very interesting to actually watch and just consume right yeah. so um yeah i think chefs are very interesting people to watch out for <laughs> so okay uh, in terms of like pop ups we briefly discussing pop ups and you had invite a lot of chefs cuz i was talking to ashwin from your team and he was saying how the outbound and inbound completely mm-hmm. works so there's a lot of chefs coming from bombay or delhi what exactly is the selection process like how do you filter it out yeah. how do you choose who's coming in and who's not coming in what is the entire thought process behind it uh so initially it was a lot of us having to reach out to you know who we wanted mm-hmm. here and now it's become a bit of both in fact it's a lot more you know inbound than mm-hmm. you know outbound which is great because that's really what we wanted um the selection process from the beginning has always been almost like a peer a peer review Got it. but so i i kind of take um i kind of take the word of the other chefs very very seriously mm-hmm. so if i were to kind of work with somebody who i have you know i've never met or i've never seen at work or i've never tasted their food then i will make sure i at least talk to 10 chefs who know their work fair right that's uh, for me that's the main mm-hmm. main feedback that i need uh and and they're very very generous with their help you know like nobody has ever told me listen i don't know please go and like just find out yourself <laughs> or something like you know everybody has been very very sweet that way about that um so i we have got a very good uh, peer review system that we try and do uh it's very casual it's not like you know we just give them these questions and they have to answer it's just really me asking them a lot of things um so that's one way in which we do it of course the other things are we you know generally if we've already had their food then we know um we also kind of have a pulse now on what people here will be excited about right it's it's a very it's kind of a mixed thing between gut feeling and also seeing about what's worked here and then also knowing their brand mm-hmm. so it's kind of like a mix of things uh but yeah that's usually a peer review process or we you know either know them really well but what our audience really like just tells us is really what we take very seriously as how well. do you gauge the pulse so we talk to a lot of our audience members so every time they hear we talk to a lot of them um and they're very they're very critical about their feedback as well because i think they also feel invested in this space otherwise they won't be telling you that right because it's a community space at the heart of it people want to tell you the community you. part is actually yeah. quite strong yeah it's actually oh, works yeah. for us yeah it actually works for us because they feel like acha if we want to come for the next meal and we are part of it mm-hmm. then just might as well give them the feedback, feedback right? right so that way i think the community keeps us in check in a lot of ways so the ideas come from them um a lot of them like just tell us who they want here next and you know those kind and you guys go out searching them yeah it's definitely i mean it's quite just, organic in terms yeah, of planning what sort of it's very organic event. yeah and over the last couple of weeks uh, over the last couple of months we've been seeing a lot of pr people reach out to us actually from the pr teams asking if their brands and you know like the chefs can come in so that's been a newer development mm-hmm. that we've been seeing interesting and they yeah. really brands from bombay and delhi cause they're trying yeah, to yeah go to bombay and delhi to me yeah. like a lot of restaurants that yeah. are opening up they want to do a pop up here yeah. in order to spread the word i think yeah i mean it could be it could be either because they want to open here and they're mm-hmm. trying to like just test the market mm-hmm. or um it's kind of good marketing for them you know in general or because bangalore also i mean the crowd that like just comes here i'm sure travels a lot yeah uh, definitely so whenever they eat somebody's food here i'm sure they'll go to the restaurant there and yeah. have it uh, and that's a very strong word of mouth sort of definitely. you know like just marketing so i think that helps as well 
and that's also increased quite a lot right people yeah. traveling for food now yeah like yeah. with uh, chef pratik opening a place in uh, uh kasoli and yeah. all i think uh, earlier because i remember when michelin star guides used to come out the three needed it needed to be a restaurant that people would travel for yeah and i was just like i don't think india yeah. in india people would do that i'm very excited about that like yeah. i love traveling for food yeah. so food. yeah right? I mean, the entire concept of michelin came into saying like how much people would travel to get the food right it's like what so the, the more most... remote you are yeah. uh, the better chances you have yeah. in terms and of everything the japanese are masters of that yeah. you know, they'll make you travel mm-hmm. so given the different restaurants and brands trying to reach out and come in here and given the experience dealing with the bangalore public what kind of cuisines are really working here right you know there's a huge difference between what works in bombay and what works in bangalore because it's more of a techie crowd the age group is slightly different so what do you think is like popping cuisines in bangalore and people are excited for mm It's very interesting because we're also trying to crack that, and we've just been a year and a half since we've been doing this, so we're still in the process of understanding that. But definitely, we've seen a trend towards um, non-Indian food. Interesting. And I kind of don't understand. I get it, but I don't want to get it. You know, because um, like you want Indian food also to do really well yes. because people are really expressing themselves through Indian food beautifully nowadays. um but i think the audience is still a lot more excited about non indian uh cuisines like japanese mm-hmm. or mexican you know these are the things that they are really really excited about try something new yeah indian food i still think the notion of it being accessible is still so strong that it doesn't feel like so novel correct you know but when you sorry when yeah. you say indian food are you saying like the traditional indian food or even the fusion and modern even the indian? fusion and modern indian food is a harder sell for us i feel okay. than the non indian food it takes longer and harder for us to sell those kind of meals as opposed to the non indian ones and why do you think so yeah i think that's the idea of accessibility that they think that they think that are indian food we, we know you know kind of thing this. or we can always access it especially south indian food is that much harder for us to yeah. sell because of you know where we are um we I mean, also see like places like the bombay canteen or mm-hmm. siena like you know doing their own take on the indian version yeah. but they seem to pop off like what is different than why do people think okay that's something i'm willing to experiment rather than someone else doing uh, conceptually you have to be very strong or you have to have an amazing chef chef right yeah. like hussein is a star there's no doubt about it i don't think i've had anything that he's made that is not tasted <laughs> like whatever it is right um and Oroni, I have not tasted Oroni's food, but I've heard amazing things about it. So if their if their like just reputation precedes them, mm-hmm. then of course that helps, right? Uh, or conceptually, you have to be really strong. Okay. Uh, and a lot of restaurants, the newer ones that we see around here, they may be they may look really great and they may you know have all the shebang when it comes to the space. But I find a lot of them, um, you know, if we we feel that if the concepts are not very strong. Yeah, then you don't know really what you're buying, mm-hmm. right? So that kind of then translates into lower sales. So for us, I feel if it's the chef or the concept that really have to be the hero of, you know, of the meal that you have here. Interesting. But a question from that statement that you know a lot of restaurants focus more on the, uh, yeah, facade rather yeah. than the actual product. Yeah. Um, uh, since you have an architecture background, yeah. which restaurants do you feel are? Uh, Architecturally or design-wise, really sound, or that you will see like, places like Lupa, Muru, and all these places yeah. opening up in Bangalore now. Architecture, but that's their concept is uh, like a different one, right? Yeah. That go extra yeah. to the T of it. Yeah. But personally, from your personal taste or or the sort of design you like, which restaurant do you think has done a good job uh, in Bangalore? Ah, uh, we're not a restaurant, but the conservatory is great. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but I think like whenever you talk about what's a great space to eat at, design-wise, whenever the marriage between what the product is and the space is a perfect one, that's when you feel ah, there's what's something amazing here. Yeah, like it has to be authentic in in both ways. Hmm. And I'm going to take a very different route on this and answer. You know, CTR. When yes. you go sit in CTR. Yeah. It's not just the food; it's just the way the space yeah, yeah, yeah. is, right? You can be in Mangalore sitting there and eating, mm-hmm. or you can be. But it's kind of it really, the food and the space are in unison. Correct. There's no, 
there's no like just disconnect between the two at all, right? That's to me very interesting. I think Naru is very nice that way. Mm -hmm. Like when you walk in there, you know it's a Japanese yeah, space, definitely. right? Um, I used to like toast and tonic a lot. You know, I actually yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, uh, but I used to like toast and tonic. The space, I loved the size. Yeah. You know, it, it was. I think it was trying to be like an East Village, New York sort of thing. Yeah. It was perfectly yeah. that. It was perfectly that. I think that had a. You know, it had a vibe to it that was great. So the cuisine agnostic part, at least yeah. when I joined, that all the yeah. things were set. But that's something as a chef I found interesting that they weren't putting themselves into a, a certain... Like a box, like, right? This yeah. is the only cuisine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is, I think was exciting for the customers as well. Yeah, and it was. The chef. It was. And I liked the space. It was nice. It was, it was nice beautifully space. done. Yeah. I think Chef Malu and... I don't know. Shruti. Shruti. Maya yeah. design, yeah. But do you think like this is a temporary boom in Bangalore? Because you know you see the thing in Bombay like soon after over time the real estate became a constraint and mm. people had to innovate within small spaces, right? So Bangalore also recently had this boom in the past two years with new restaurants, bars coming up. In fact, this year there's every month so, many. Like, so many restaurants yeah. and bars coming up. Do you think there's a saturation point for that where audience are fed up of it? Like they already have enough experiences. What is this then? What's your take on it? If it's the same experience each time, then yes, you know it's going to get boring very soon. But I don't think we're at a What's saturation point yet? You know, I think there's a lot more scope for good, for good products to be out there. A lot of them are just cookie cutter at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, speciality, a concept, speciality food, being very focused, mm -hmm. being very craft is never going to go out of fashion. Definitely. Niches never. always work, right? People always come for that. I think so. I think so. So that's never going to go out of fashion, especially because that's what we've been trying to work on and kind of really stand for as well. So I see that mm -hmm. a lot more in a lot of places that I go to, that if you are really driven by a passion towards a certain craft, a certain focus, then that can, I mean, those things are not dependent on trends and fashion Definitely. at all. You know, those are like for the books. 100%. Yeah. And I don't think that's going to stop here in Bangalore. So given your understanding on how the market's going to look, right? So what do you have planned for Courtyard or what do you have planned for Conservatory to adapt, right? So how are we going to scale your pop-ups? What's the thought oh. process behind this? Um, I think for, for the first one and a half years, was it was just good for us to just test the concept to see, okay, will this even work? Do we even need a space like mm -hmm. this? So that's been answered to a certain extent. So now we're trying to see what do we do with this next? So what? What kind of collaborations do we want? Are we going to look at, you know, international chefs? Are we going to look at a lot more collaborations, like just between chefs? Mm -hmm. So those are things that we are kind of exploring at the moment to see what it is. Because growth need not always be scale, right? Yeah. Growth can always just be, you know, like, it can be impact mm -hmm. as well and not just scale. So we're trying to understand for ourselves what is more impactful as opposed to scale, scale. you know. Um, so that's the plan for the next one year to see what we can be more in, impactful with, with the food. Uh, but we have a new wine bar opening, which is really a concept that grew, at, you know, at the conservatory, right? So we had the WIP, which is mm -hmm. called the Wine in Progress. With Chef Karan, if I'm not Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With Chef Karan and we have Tarani, who's, you know, handling the wines. Uh, so they kind of did the WIP here, which worked as a weekday wine bar. Interesting. Uh, where you could just come out after after work, have a glass or two of wine, have some two, three small plates. You don't have to get drunk. You just kind of are happy and you go home. So that was the idea that we were experimenting with for about six months. And I personally felt that there was a lot of scope for a small wine bar mm -hmm. to actually be there. Uh, and that really is the product, you know, of the conservatory. So it, now it's going to move downstairs where we'll have a permanent home, mm -hmm. where we'll have the WIP, which will be operating every day now. Cool. Uh, and we have Arijit Bose, uh, mm. who I think is top, you know, barman, you know, in mm. India. I mean, he's done a great job with Spirit Forward. Spirit right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Everyone's. It's just magic when he's on board. So he's really helping us, you know, do the wine bar together. Again with Tarani, you know, and with Karan. So it's the same old team, but mm. we've got, you know, Arijit's madness come in. And much bigger scale, right? Actually, scale is small, but the dreams are bigger, Big you know. Um, so that's the next plan for mm. us. That's so growth for us is will always be these newer concepts, right? You like do smaller things, but newer things. Mm -hmm. That's really the way we want kind of grow. Um, yeah, and then we hopefully will have an interesting what coffee shop coming up 
which I'll tell you more about next time. We'll love to hear more about the next time, yes. But yes, like, you know, just I'm very curious, right? Every time I come for a pop-up, you yeah. know, I really want to understand the unit economics behind the pop-up, mm. right? So, I would really love to hear the cost breakdown for a chef. If I'm an aspiring chef and want to set up a pop-up at the conservatory, what does the cost breakdown looks like and how exactly does the logistic work? Yeah, so, um, it's very, very different for, you know, like every pop-up that we do because uh, I don't think we've ever had one that you know, ever had two that have been the same, right? Everything mm -hmm. has been very different. But generally, uh, the costing generally is that if you're going to get an out-of-town chef, you have to account for their travel and stay, and then you account for their, you know, food cost. Uh, so the ingredients, the travel and stay really becomes the major part of, you know, of the expenditure. Um, because a lot of people, you know, also sometimes ask us, like, why is the meal four and a half thousand? You know, like, is it even worth it? Well, it's not just about it for that food. A lot of it goes into that plate actually landing up at your table, right? The chefs have to travel and come. They have to think about a lot of things for weeks. They're leaving uh, days of, um, you know, like just revenue back there and they're, you know, like coming here. There's a lot of work. Like every pop-up of ours, I think, has been in the making for no less than three months. Oh, wow. No less than three months. All pop-ups take three months of prep. I mean, you have to talk constantly, you know, have have discussions. I mean, three months, I think, has been the minimum that we spend, you know, on every pop-up, right? So, um, from like marketing teams having to talk, from chefs and us having to talk, they they do like just menu samples, then we give the feedback and then there's a lot of, you know, back and forth that happens. So, it's a lot of time. Definitely. So, um, and of course, the whole transport and having to bring them down here and when they come here they don't want to just feed you anything they want to feed you the best mm -hmm. so you know ingredient costs are never low right when they are here because they want the best of the best um so and then once we kind of take out all the expenditure here then there's the cost that either comes to us and you know you know and to the chef so that four and a half thousand or that three and a half thousand or two and a half thousand which you're eating for really involves all of this, all of this right um and usually, I would say about 50 to about 60% uh, goes in the expenditure of all these things, like the food, sourcing, produce, putting sourcing, yeah, up to 70% sometimes wow. even. And the remaining 30 to about 40% is what we split with, you know, with like the chefs that Chef, we get. Brand yeah. and, and sometimes the split between us is a is a real, you know, it's a real factor about why they're doing the pop-up. If they're doing it just as a PR exercise, then it's for, you know, something else. If they're doing it as, you know, if, they, if they're doing it as a matter of like just their work and just sustenance, then, you know, it's something yeah, else. Children. For actual revenue, then it's something else. So it really depends on, on the person that we work with. Mm -hmm. uh, but as the conservatory, we have a general cost that we kind of, you know, incur for, you know, like every seating that we do. So that's something that we try to keep and make sure we at least make because make it's back. it's just the it's just the what minimum cost that one needs to just keep it running. But if it feels like we're making a lot of money, no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> also, to run a space mm. like Courtyard where there's so many moving parts and yeah. there's so many so much coordination with other brands and all. Yeah. Uh, choosing the team yeah. becomes a major, and you have some great people like Viksha, Ashwin, Arimal. So when you are choosing your staff into building a dream that, uh, like your own personal dream, what factors did you choose? Because you need somebody who's A, on board with your dream yeah. and also ready to work around with so many people. Yeah. For a space like this team is the backbone, right? Are they yeah, ready yeah, to yeah. go execute and coordinate? Yeah. Because it's different from restaurants. So even though you're looking for hospitality people, they have to do a lot more stuff yeah. apart from what they're used to. Correct. So did it take convincing or were you looking out at certain things in a employee that was the you know deciding factor but mm -hmm. what do you look for in a employee um, yeah so when we do interviews usually i'm always gauging for what company culture first if they're really going to fit into that culture that i think the space really speaks about mm -hmm. right so you know we are a community space you know we are a culture space we are uh but we need to be run like a you know hospitality space, right? So that's the uh, backbone, you know, and the what framework of the space. Mm. So I kind of generally like to, you know, hire people who get that part mm. of it, right? Um, they have to be able to like to talk to people. They have to, 
uh, be able to you know interact they have to be able to understand that they're working at a community space mm. um, they have to be interested in the larger culture mm. of things um, I look for a certain amount of creativity mm. also um, but really at the end of the day I I look for is will I be able to work with them right because I'm here all every day and even though I don't want to be <laughs> I, I am here every day and I have to interact a lot with the staff and it's it's very um, it's a very feedback loop mm -hmm. you know thing that we have here right like it's not like I'm saying do this and they have to do it it's 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 all that we you know we think together and we do it so unless I kind of feel that I can work with them then it's very hard to kind of see them work here right? so that's one of the things that I look at um, but yeah, having being well spoken, having an interest in things that are more than just the space, being a bit more what culturally aware, being um, being able to like just talk to people is generally one of the A things that I look for. But creativity as well, as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think the space being the way it is anyway attracts a certain type of people, kind of employee crop. Yes. You know, so that helps already in a way. And do you find it difficult to find such people or has it been with it's very difficult. because there's so many people like, I'm pretty sure a lot of people must be coming up during these events yeah. and be like I want to work here yeah, yeah. and stuff like that, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, we've had a lot of people ask us if they could work here and a lot of them we've hired also. But it's generally I find it not so easy to find like the people that I would, you know, I would want to see here because that mix is hard to find. Hmm. You know, it's very elusive. Yeah, hardworking yeah. and culturally <laughs> and social is, yeah. is difficult. <laughs> yeah. Mix of yeah. uh, qualities. True. So like, you know, coming back to the entire pop-up scene, like, you know, just one last curious question. So we had a lot of people, so we asked our community certain questions and wanted to see what they want to ask you. But like a lot of chefs here wondering, like, how much can they potentially make from a three-day pop-up? Right? So like, based on the covers, what is the average thing that a chef for a brand can look for if it's revenue? centric what is the expectations usually like um very difficult to answer that because like i said we've got so many formats that happen here but i think uh leaving aside like the expenditure part of it if you were to take home a certain amount that you're looking for it could really vary anywhere like if it's like a fee sort of thing which you just like just take back it really could vary anywhere between like say a um, 20000 to a 2 lakhs that's really the range that we're looking at when you actually do, you know, when you actually do an event. And it's always through a three-day period of time. I say, no, no, it could be one day. It could be just one seating. Uh, it, it, it could be three days. I think when we had Mizu from Bombay here, we had, we had like a five-day pop-up. Oh, wow. We had nine seatings. So it really depends on um, a lot of things when we really put down a format for a chef, mm -hmm. it completely depends on what the menu is, what their team size is, you know, what do they want to do, what is the costing. Mm -hmm. When you look at all of that, it's only then you know how many seatings you can do and you know what you'll make. So it's very, very um, personal and very centric to each Okay. Each event. There's, there's no, no formula. specific business model. There's no formula. I mean, there is a business model, which is a which is like the larger business model mm -hmm. of the conservatory. But there's no formula that you apply yeah. to, you know, every pop-up that happens. It's very, different in its own way. It's very personalized to each chef. Yeah. So, I mean, Tushar, you had experiences doing pop-ups here and you come and so like, how exactly was experience holistically and what did you find that this space is provide that others didn't? Because we do see a lot of competition coming up in the community spaces. And how exactly did you navigate and how did you find it? Um, I don't really think they have a competition like Courtyard or the Conservatory because um, as we discussed, it's very difficult to find a good team and which is worried about the product and uh, also wants to do new things. Correct. So I have done around, I think, two pop-ups with them now. And it's been an amazing experience out and out. I, ever since the single thread days, I think Courtyard, I was anyways a fan. Uh, because of our work, we don't really get to come to a lot of the events. Like I see them on Instagram and I'm like, shit, I want to go <laughs> But you couldn't. So I'm trying now, now that I'm a little free to actively come and... Yeah. Uh, uh, but the two pop-ups that I did have been amazing. The team's great. I know quite a lot of them now mm -hmm. personally. They're very helpful. Uh, they'll uh, try and think of the things that you are missing out when you're doing your pop-up. 
and also while the pop up is happening they are very uh, active and trying to support you in how you know they can help you push out a better product which as a chef is i think one of the biggest things you are asking from a venue or a yeah. team and uh, more than that i think the biggest thing that i'm impressed by of this whole space and community is bringing multiple chefs together we were talking off camera and i had this thought because i think i'm from the kitchen side that uh usually chefs are egoistic people and like the bigger you are the more you think it that you know same with all creative fields it should be yeah it should be just me so the fact that uh, courtyard could do uh the almost not impossible but a difficult task of bringing different chefs together help them do takeovers together without limelight being on one person on one product is something really commendable and uh, i love that i also love how it's a safe space right. and not once have i come and felt that you know people are not enjoying both from the community side and from the people who are cooking so that way i think yeah that's been an amazing experience thank you and i'd recommend anybody <laughs> if anybody is thinking this is your time yeah and if somebody has to reach out to you guys is it usually through socials yeah they could i mean uh, you know all our information is up there you know on the website or instagram they can just call us we're very very accessible we're always looking to work with you know interesting people creative people so yeah just call us <laughs> yeah that's fine so i think that brings uh, conclusion to the podcast but usually we do this with all the speakers we have a quick rapid fire round mm. where we ask a bunch of questions and expect some answers like where's so, the coffee <laughs> where's the coffee at guys and the hamper right yeah <laughs> no, i'm not doing this <laughs> we'll get the couch next time and we'll say yeah which is a good idea yeah <laughs> next to a hamper <laughs> Uh, so yeah you want to start with the question okay i'll start with the most basic one which has been your best and your worst pop up experience till now a um, best pop up experience i think i have to name three i can't name one definitely husain for just just blasting us through i think six you know seatings in the best way possible it was a dream to watch gresham because it was just like this symphony playing in front of you and showing you what experience does and you know and like just coven because it's homeboy so <laughs> she's always the best yeah okay. the worst experience the worst pop up worst experience <laughs> <laughs> love that i told him that <laughs> the next question would be if you weren't doing courtyard then what would you be doing in life ah uh, taking care of my two girls at home mm-hmm. maybe cooking for them a little actually no i'd like to be the mayor of bangalore since <laughs> five the urban planning comes and what's the first thing you change about it lal bag what is your dream lal bag thing or do you think it's good the way it is oh lal bag is fine the way it is but i i hate hedges you know like parks should never have a hedge it's such a particular mm. need <laughs> i don't think i have a hedge like almost. parks should never have hedges you know like just public spaces should never have a hedge and why because it's just boundaries you know it re it, it reinforces boundaries of go here don't go there sort of thing which should never be there you know in like this public space yeah pretty cool so if you had to say one meal as your last meal which one would it be mangalorean food any day mangi food any specific dish that comes to kori roti Ooh, that makes Kori-roti. sense uh one more question i had is like um, what's your favorite thing about the courtyard one thing you had to choose the favorite thing about the entire space uh grandma's house has to be the best thing you know it really kind of ignited everything for us so happy to be here and the next thing has to be the team that we have mm-hmm. yeah very cool okay and the last one <laughs> what one event in future or or your dream event at the conservatory that you're planning uh um, want to host i don't know about dream event but i've had had like a list of people that i want to see here doing a pop up and Chef Manu is always the top of my list. Yes, He's not yet come and I'm hoping he comes. Fingers crossed. Fingers yeah, crossed. I can't wait. Some day I don't even have the guts to ask. <laughs> It should be easy later we just drop him a DM and like hey. No. <laughs> <laughs> drop into loop or get a hot chocolate and make it. Maybe I last to shut. Oh, not now. <laughs> we can still at least connect <laughs> and he's coming any which way. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll stand in the side somewhere. Mhm. Will you do a pop up? Pull the card up. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. And uh, you mentioned international chefs. Like mm. do you have any particular chef in mind when you said that? 
or you would want them to come to courtyard ah because that'll be so cool that'll that, be cool, but that the list is too huge there's so many people that i would i would love to have here you know but um i think the region that we would like to sort of uh, start off with would definitely be asia because that's something that you know there's so much talent there and there's so many concept meals and you know bars there that i would definitely try and look at something from there and maybe mexico or argentina maybe argentina <laughs> mexican cuisine works very well in india right because yeah. the flavors are almost same and people can kind of, i think mexicans were indians that at some point shared <laughs> yeah, there are too many similarities in their food and their culture and uh, i think that's why it's picking up yeah definitely But yes, uh, thanks for joining us today, Thank Akila. You. It was a very insightful and lovely conversation with you. I hope the audience feels the same as well, yeah. given the point as we have spoken. But happy to have you on the next episode and talk more once your coffee shops up as well. Yeah, yeah. And excited to see how the courtyard pans out in the next coming months. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Pleasure Thank having you. you on the show. Thank thanks. you.